Western Teacher Live, talking about public education, unionism and much more. Hello and welcome to Western Teacher Live, the SSTUWA's podcast talking all things public education. And this is a very special edition looking at Facing the Facts, a review of public education in Western Australia. The State School Teachers Union commissioned the review and appointed Dr Carmen Lawrence AO as chair. Dr Lawrence is a former WA Premier and Treasurer, a WA Minister for Education and Aboriginal Affairs, a former Federal Minister for Health and Human Services and a Professor Emeritus at UWA. Uh, Dr Lawrence was joined on the panel by Dr Scott Fitzgerald, Associate Professor in, Professor in the School of Management and Marketing at Curtin University and a renowned expert in education research. Colin Pettit, former Commissioner for Children and Young People of WA and former Secretary of Education in Tasmania. And Dr Robin White, a former secondary school teacher, head of department, deputy principal, project manager and principal and former lecturer and education consultant. The panel was supported by Executive Officer Pam Pollard, a former primary school teacher, curriculum manager, former principal of an IPS primary schools and principal fellow Harvard Graduate School of Education. And I'm delighted to welcome Carmen Lawrence and Colin Pettit with me to discuss the review. Uh, Welcome to you both. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, Carmen, can you just take us through initially just the process the review followed? Yes. um, We started off by obviously um, responding to the terms of reference, which basically asked us to have a look at the state of education of Western Australia and in particular the changes that had taken place that were having an impact on teachers' morale, teachers' workload, and, of course, ultimately the outcome for students. So we, we sat down and we mapped out a series of discussions that we needed to have with teachers, with parents, with the specialist organisations, and we organised, or at least Pam and <laughs> others organised for us to meet with staff and parents all around the state. So we had a series of meetings both with union members and with other staff and other parents um, from all the way from Broome, to Esperance and in each of those meetings at least one panel member would be there and we went through the terms of reference with them. In addition we called for submissions and we uh, had over 100, indeed 130 odd submissions from around the state, many from teachers but also from professional organisations and from parent groups. So I think we got a pretty good feel through that process uh, of meeting and submissions uh, with the issues that were important to people. But in addition, of course, we reviewed the literature. We looked very hard at research that had been done on many of the questions that were put to us, and we assembled those ultimately in the the report that is now being released. And, of course, it was an extremely highly qualified panel, which is is tremendous. Colin, were you surprised at the level of interest in the review? One of the aims of, of the union in starting the review was to prompt a discussion about the issues in public education and it certainly seemed to do that. No, I wasn't surprised by the uh, by the enthusiasm of people who actually came forward to help put their case forward. Um, I was surprised probably by their enthusiasm to the level of their enthusiasm in terms of uh, how they wanted to make the system better and um, it was really pleasing to see that many of them came with very, very constructive views. I think that's an important point, Carmen, that that this was about providing workable solutions, not just compiling a list of grievances, if you like. That's right. I mean, it was very clear that that people who talked to us were committed to better outcomes for students, um, knowing that, you know, highly motivated, professionally supported teachers are likely to produce that outcome. And so while many of them were critical of the way things were currently going, they saw opportunities for improvement, and that's what we've tried to reflect in the report. So certainly we identify the problems, but we also identify workable solutions, knowing that too often in education, people propose things that need to be done, make recommendations, then it sits in the bottom drawer somewhere gathering dust. So we hope to engage uh, through the teachers' union with the, the government and policy makers, because these are all achievable objectives. And I think that's one of the things a lot of teachers would say, is that the, the solutions to their problems are, are put upon them rather than them aren't being asked for, for what would work. So I think that'll be most welcome. Um, now, as you're listening to this podcast, you won't be surprised that such an extensive process has resulted in a very thorough and wide-ranging report. Um, as we just said, does recommend solutions rather than just listing issues. Um, and you as members or people who are just interested in uh, publication in general as parents or community members or MPs, community leaders, you can find both the condensed findings 
and a recommendation document along with the full report on our website, www.sstuwa.org.au. Um, and you will also find the summary document if you're members and you get your Western teacher. If you're an online subscriber, you'll find it there. And if you get the print version delivered, it is incorporated into the edition of Western Teacher. will be arriving across the next week or two into your mailboxes. Um, so, Carmen, having talked about process and, and talked about the wide geographic spread, and I think there are also online forums as well, so people got to have their say, what, what, what were some of the key issues that were raised? Well, one of the things that was very clear is, is there's been a steady stream of um, reforms, and I put that in inverted commas, to the education system, uh, arising both from state and federal governments, which have simply increased the workload without necessarily improving either the experience of teachers and their capacity to perform at their best or the outcomes for students. I mean, the most significant of those was the independent schools um, pro program, the idea that public schools could be all independent from one another with pr uh, principals particularly having a say over the appointment of staff. And there were a lot of downsides with that. And we found that there were no tangible benefits to students. You know, a lot, a lot of effort had gone into this process over a decade or more of change. Um, teachers were, were reporting to us that they, particularly in rural and remote areas, were stuck in many cases, unable to move. And uh, the, the people in those regions told us that it was extremely difficult to get the best quality teachers. And often the people who um, remained there were frustrated as well. So there were a, a whole range of outcomes for the, from this system, none of which were particularly beneficial to anybody concerned and just uh, increased the workload uh, substantially. Local uh, selection, you know, said to be important, had resulted in um, stasis in the system and people being caught and unable to move. Yeah. And sort of that ended at, at both ends of the chain, in effect, people not coming to get experience in the rural locations and the regional locations, not learning their trade out there. And then at, at the other end of the, the process, those who used to go and do two or three years in the country and, and might love it and stay mm -hmm. are now not even going. No, because they know that the chances of, you know, then moving on through their career are stymied. And so what's the, the, the sort of outcome you're looking at for that as, as to how that could be addressed? Well, one of the things we recommend a little later in the report is that the um, selection of teachers should revert to the education system. In, in other words, we're saying you need to recreate a system. There are all sorts of reasons why the independent schools um, model has failed, and one of them is that that flexibility of appointment has actually resulted in poor outcomes. And in addition to that, you know, you've had people sort of complaining, I think, reasonably that they haven't had support. The independent schools have been asked to do everything. And the, the level of teacher support, the level of support for children with problems has also diminished. And so some of our recommendations go to improving that outcome. In other words, recreating an organisation where teachers know that they can go uh, to a system, to <laughs> the central office, to the regional office to get help. And again, we, we talk about this, that one of the big issues that we hear a lot from members is the old support services have, have diminished, the regionalised support that schools got. Because, because everything's been plonked on to individual schools, that support network has diminished. And there might be some out there who love that. They're more independent as leaders of schools and, and some of them are members. So, um, but, but then they don't have the support when they do need it. Is that one of the issues that came up? I think one of the noticeable things that uh, we heard from a range of people, particularly those in the country, was that the lack of consistency by a system that allowed them to be confident that when they did their work, uh, they'd be well supported. And having uh, this splinter approach, which is what IPS has, has now formed, even though it was unintentional, has meant that many teachers feel quite isolated. And that was expressed really loudly to us. And in that isolation, they then felt that they weren't uh, being supported in a way that they could develop their own skills, which then translated into having difficulty moving back into preferred locations once they're out in the country. And again, that just creates inequality right across the board. And of course, over time too, you, you get that shortage of teachers, which is across the board. And I know we'll come into that in different areas and, and much harder to address when you're so restricted in your movement across schools. A um, couple of other issues that are mentioned in the report, and we know some of these are going to have 
you know, political implications of people backing away from previous commitments. Um, you talk about NAPLAN, you talk about reporting and indeed uh, vocational education in schools, all key issues. They are indeed. And I mean, NAPLAN's very interesting because it was introduced with great fanfare as being of benefit to everybody, you know, for teachers to so that they knew with, with how their students were progressing from parents and so on. But the evidence is in now, and it's in nationally, it's not just in Western Australia, that the um, NAPLAN results are kind of pr- flatlining at best, and, and some areas have gone backwards. Some areas there's slight improvement. It's taken an enormous amount of effort um, to get the system up and running. Um, the federal government now is involved in education to a degree that was previously unthinkable, given our constitution. And there's a lot of money, in my view, going into uh, the organisation, not just of NAPLAN, but other areas of the, the, the national government's uh, interventions here, which is then not available to schools. So NAPLAN is in a sense a symptom of that, but it certainly hasn't helped and it causes problems in schools, both in terms of the way they teach. A lot of teachers reported that the pressure was on them to teach to the test, um, that other you know, broader educational objectives suffered in that process, which is why our very first recommendation was that any, any reforms, in inverted commas, any changes should have as their first objective the improvement of the uh, outcomes for students, n- not just narrowly defined um, numeracy literacy ones, but broader educational objectives as well, which is something Teach was very, very clear uh, about with us. And we think that we should move toward, um, in a sense, a sample testing. If we want to find how the nation's going, let's do what the international tests do, take occasional measures, um, knowing the limitations of these one-off tests, they're not helpful for teachers monitoring students in their class. They're, they're, out, they're usually out of date and they're one point in time and they're not a good reflection of what it is that's happening in the classroom. And I suppose, Colin, too, the, one of the problems that's developed over time is this sort of league standings that people love, very simplistic, taken from, from NAPLAN and almost become a circular cause of let's teach to the test because the only result that matters is where we sit on the league table when the NAPLAN results come out. I think when you talk to um, teachers as we have, you see that um, the impact of NAPLAN is having on not only their health and wellbeing, but the fact that they they can't get a run at um, trying to educate the children as the way they believe it should be uh, and meet all curriculum issues. Um, We need to stop and reflect, as Carmen has said, uh, why are we investing so much in NAPLAN with no real outcome for it. So we've had no real improvement. Uh, It's been in for years and years, and it's time that collectively, from government down, we stop and have a look at why are we investing in something that is not working or not actually helping us to improve? And is there a better way of actually doing that? And teachers overwhelmingly are saying, we cannot keep doing what we're doing. We are under pressure to deliver just on literacy and numeracy, Um, There are so many factors outside of the school that are now impacting on children uh, that these these particular tests are not actually representative of what's really happening in schools. And again, perhaps part of the link to that too is is around curriculum support. We talk about if it's like a political imperative to have NAPLAN at the moment. Um, Similarly, with the curriculum, a number of the changes, and I think somewhere in the book it's about three or four pages of lists of, th- of things that have changed yes. over recent years. It's, it's extraordinary, really, when you see it uh, in that format. Um, and regular changes to the curriculum are another one. And you talk about that, about the need for more support um, for SCARSA, the, the uh, School Curriculum and Standards Authority, which does a very good job but, but is probably very much under-resourced at the moment. Um, and also the, the ability to allow teachers to develop their own skills in teaching the curriculum as it changes through face-to-face training and professional development. That's right. I mean, that's the core of a teacher's professional competence is being able to develop curriculum, um, tailor it to the needs of their students and with a body like SCARSA who work very closely with teachers and don't release any material until it's been tested, road tested. And teachers were very positive about that process as opposed to some national insistence on certain curriculum material that may not be suitable at all for their for their students. So the funny thing about the Independent Public Schools Initiative is it went in exactly the wrong direction when it came to autonomy. It should really have been about curriculum and, and pedagogy, the techniques of teaching, giving you know greater independence for teachers in particular and specialists to craft 
what was needed for their students. So we're very keen to to say that SCARSA should be better resourced. There should be more training for teachers, you know, in the material that's available to them and give them a greater professional autonomy in that in that space. Yeah, absolutely crucial. And and of course, 